Okay. So um, our next speaker is Steve Prager, who is a principal scientist working on big data in agriculture at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, a not-for-profit research and development organization based in Colombia, dedicated to reducing poverty and hunger uh, um, while protecting natural resources in developing countries. He was previously a professor of geography at University of Wyoming. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David and, and everybody. Um, could you tell me if you're seeing the slide we, view? Or we could see it fine for a moment, and now we're seeing a button that says resume slideshow. All right. Fantastic. Uh, you're not full screen, but we can see the slides. Okay. Um, how about now? Is it okay? Perfect. Great. Thanks. Uh, so, so again, uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's a challenging yeah, some actually a lot of people contribute. Uh, sorry, you might be having audio issues. Um, can you check your your audio connection or or reconnect if you're if you're using headphones? Uh, just you're cutting in and out a little bit. The video is perfectly clear. How's this, David? Very clear. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And uh, sorry for the uh, the uh, glitches there. So, um, I, I'm, as I was saying, uh, uh, this was a hard talk to put together. Uh, I, I was trying to really show the range of uh, approaches that we're using within our context of, of uh, research for, for agriculture uh, development in terms of how we're using artificial intelligence, machine learning to support decision-making and, and improvement of agricultural and uh, food systems. So what you'll see today is an assembly of a, a variety of different projects that we're working with various stakeholders and, and all have been involved in a handful of them and, and at the same time um, have leveraged many of the others myself and, and, and some of my own decision-making and, and some of my own work that I've been doing. Uh, the, the idea of, th of this talk when it was initially presented to me was to talk about the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in relation to climate smart agriculture. And it's important to point out that the climate smart agriculture is a jargon these days and it, it actually has a pretty specific meaning depending on the circles in which uh, one exists. And, and in our particular case, uh, climate smart agriculture implies agriculture that's really functioning at the center of these three primary pillars, adaptation, food security, and mitigation. Uh, there's, there's any number of, of possible objectives that could come from climate smart agriculture implementation, and it may be something as simple, uh, as simple in quotes as in, improved productivity, but it may also be something like improved climate resilience over uh, long-term reduction in emissions, reduction in emissions and, and, and sequestration of carbon even. And then likewise, uh, more social oriented outcomes such as um, improved gender and uh, social inclusion. So there's a broad range of things that are, are characterized as climate smart agriculture. And, and oftentimes this is a lens that we use when we look at solving specific problems. Um, there's plenty of problems to solve. Uh, uh, these articles are just a handful of the types of challenges that we face on a regular basis, whether it's serious drought affecting uh, the, uh, what's referred to as the dry corridor in Central America, a deforestation here in, here in Colombia, um, uh, problems with banana disease and, and the rapidity at which different bana uh, banana diseases are moving throughout banana producing regions and so on. There's a large number of challenges that we're facing, and a lot of them can be approached from an analytics perspective. And, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to step through a, uh, a, a handful of examples, and, and I want to emphasize before I get into the next step that, that, that these are 
these are analyses that are occurring at a variety of different scales from the plant to the farm to the landscape. That's not necessarily how they're organized here, but I want you to uh, think about uh, the way in which uh, different scales actually influence the way in which we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So first off, on to banana, something that most of us uh, know and love and, and consume on a, a, a near daily basis. As, as I showed one of the articles there, uh, there's a number of different banana diseases that are uh, moving very quickly throughout banana producing regions. And one of the challenges that farmers have, uh, uh, whether they're small scale farmers or large plantation farmers, is identifying what types of diseases their, their particular crop has, given environmental and other local contexts. And so one of the things that we've done here is we've used um, um, deep learning approach to help farmers evaluate the way, uh, the nature of the uh, disease that their banana plant may have and, and also identify if perhaps what they're seeing is not actually disease but related to some other issue, uh, for instance, nutrient in, uh, availability. And, and so uh, um, this is a, uh, a relatively simple app that does a complex job and it, it allows farmers to take pictures of uh, the bananas, uh, uh, banana leaves, stems, flowers, and so on put those pictures into uh, the application and evaluate what the likelihood of a particular disease being present on their, their banana plants are. Um, this is again, this is at the plant scale, but oftentimes these, uh, these types of diseases manifest at, at the field scale. And if dialed into early, they can result in increased yield and, and a productivity. Another area that we're all probably uh, uh, very acquainted with is this idea of coffee and chocolate. You know, uh, most of us consume coffee and chocolate at least once a day, if not multiple times a day. Uh, coffee anyway. Uh, it, we've done a lot of work trying to understand what's going on with the impact of climate change on uh, these particular crops. These are considered high value crops uh, in areas where, where uh, we actually need to really promote economic development. There was a, uh, a, a large project ongoing here in Colombia, for example, that was using cacao as a substitute for, for illicit crops uh, uh, with the idea of generating um, uh, export markets. But in order to make those, those types of investments, uh, we have to understand what is the climate impact on these crops, given that climate is changing and affecting the regions where, where cacao and coffee are being produced. In, in this particular example, we use a, a, a random forest-based approach to understand the, the uh, growing areas for cacao in West Africa, Ghana in this particular example. And, and, and we're working to make some predictions about change in suitability in that particular region for this key crop. That would help the, the uh, planning processes in terms of how they should invest in cacao over the the uh, medium term and help guide farmers to understand if they're potentially on an edge of a, a uh, productive zone and, and maybe they should consider alternative uh, crops at some point in, in the uh, relatively near future. We've used similar approaches uh, for also looking at, uh, at coffee suitability. One of the refrains that you hear quite a bit is that robust to coffee is a is a replacement, perhaps not as tasty to a lot of people, but but more robust to to uh, climate changes. That 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 robust coffee is this replacement for 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 arabica coffee, and and that's never actually been quantified. And so uh, one of the studies that we contributed to is this idea of understanding climate suitability for robusta coffee and. And we've come to realize that actually robusta coffee is much more sensitive than people were thinking uh, and had, had sort of decided anecdotally. And so, so again, here's, here's a case where analytics are improving our understanding of, of crop performance in, as an alternative crop, for instance, to coffee that may be more affected by the, uh, the impact of, of uh, climate change. Um, a, another area where we've been working is trying to identify substitute crops. And, and so in this case, we were looking at Central America and uh, trying to understand what was going on in relation to these two key, key uh, commodity crops, high value crops, and whether or not there were changes and vulnerabilities for one crop, uh, I'm in this case, uh, particularly coffee, and whether or not cacao could be substituted as an alternative crop in, in those high value regions. 
in, in this particular case, we used a weighted ensemble of, of 17 different uh, uh, species distribution models and, 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 and develop this, uh, this trade space, if you will, for, for uh, uh, coffee and, and cacao vulnerability. A, another area that we work a lot in is, is using remote sensing and using remote sensing to understand what's going on at scale. Uh, it, uh, one of the very uh, well-known applications that we've developed here is, is uh, what we refer to as Terra I. I. I was looking at some of the other presenters coming later in the day uh, that are looking at uh, forest cover. Uh, they may be uh, familiar with this, but uh, the way it works is uh, try and understand where there's anomalies that are emerging within the forest cover that wouldn't be expected given existing forest cover over time and the relationship of forest cover changes to, to climate changes. And, and so for example, in, in this, uh, this little illustration here, the anomaly that uh, we've demonstrated is where the satellite basically says, oh, we've maybe lost some level of tree cover, but we should not have given that there was an ample amount of rain uh, that was produced. Uh, uh, this approach is, is again using convolutional neural networks and, and Bayesian probabilities to set up a, a, a time series on, on um, a MODIS uh, satellite imagery in this case. And, and again, this is just an illustration of what uh, the anomalies look like. You can see where, where the NDVI and, and the uh, rainfall have, have different signals and, and these are what we identify as, as anomalies in the context of the, the Terra I um, uh, effort. This has been used all over uh, uh, South America, Central America, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. We're working on, on, on really making this a pan-tropical solution, and uh, it's been used in a variety of applications as well. Here, for instance, we're looking at gold mining, not necessarily agriculture related, but it is uh, one of the important impacts that, uh, that we observe. And then finally, also uh, protected areas. Uh, uh, this tool is very useful for understanding whether or not uh, we see incursions of either agriculture or, or deforestation into would-be protected areas. Um, in, in a more agricultural context, we've been using similar approaches, again, uh, convolutional neural networks to identify whether or not we're looking at, at for instance, a cacao plantation or a palm plantation or, or, or even natural forests, and uh, the approach has actually proven quite, uh, quite capable for discriminating the, the uh, 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 different types of tree plantations that we might encounter. Also, again, encroaching into uh, the, the uh, uh, natural forested landscape. Um, now, moving on to crop. Uh, this is an area where, where a lot of my uh, work is taking place here uh, here in Colombia and, and uh, globally. wanted to share one particular paper that, uh, that I contributed to a, a, a few years ago because there's a nice review of different approaches to, to um, uh, modeling that, uh, that people might uh, find handy and, and, and it, it, it's a very nice summary. Uh, but, but what are we doing? We're actually taking, um, I, in this particular instance, we're using uh, a random forests and, and, and infantry trees to, to, to understand how important different variables are in, a, in affecting or in, in terms of driving yield. And uh, this is really important because it not only allows us to see what's going on with the cultivars themselves, that, uh, as you can see across all cultivars, uh, the, the cultivar is the principal variable driving variations in yield in, in uh, Vigio Vicencio, whereas in uh, Saldana, it's not only the cultivar, but then there's also, for instance, the, the average temperature at, at, um, during the, uh, the uh, reproductive stage of the crop is, is significantly pushing yield changes. And so this type of information allows us to start tailoring recommendations and with a little bit more detail actually allows us to start forming a series of recommendation domains. This is another example from uh, maize yield in uh, Mexico, where uh, we were able to go through do a very similar analysis and then understand where, where there are certain types of economies of scale and certain places that we should be concerned about uh, during, uh, during the maize season. Uh, for instance, planting more than around 60,000 seeds per hectare is not uh, a, uh, a, 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 a is not economically efficient. It, it actually lowers your return on investment. 
it doesn't optimize yield. Uh, similarly, applications of nitrogen over about 180 kilograms per hectare, again, isn't in the interest of the farmer. And then uh, below we see uh, how, how different weather circumstances um, may affect yield. And it, it starts giving people the ability to, to take decisions based on this information plus a seasonal forecast information and then ultimately plan out their season, plan out their management strategy, and, and, and develop a, a, a seasonal timescale agronomic strategy uh, that ranges from the, the uh, uh, preparatory phases to the actual selection of the cultivar to crop management and even identifying potential harvest dates and eventual yields. And this is, uh, a lot of this has been automated and is online for, for just about anyone to uh, see and use. Um, now, I'm almost done. Uh, uh, I wanted to actually just lay out a couple of challenges, uh, seeing as, as really you all are the experts in, in a lot of this, this uh, type of, uh, of analytics. Um, I would assess uh, that in agricultural development, we are largely in the competitive to differentiating phase in terms of our use of, of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. Um, we're, the, uh, the foundational work was done several years ago, I would believe, and, and again, as, as the, last, um, the uh, last speaker um, I mentioned, some of these quantitative approaches are actually quite challenging in an open field agriculture environment. So we're trying to control for, for a lot of factors that, that, that in many instances might be considered confounding factors, but we're trying to actually understand them. Uh, more recently, we've been able to, to make and really support good and sound decision making. Uh, and we're just starting to get to the point where people who are using the information are actually showing impact and, and, and value behind these types of things. But we, we haven't really seen the breakaway uh, application or the, you know, sort of the, the real differentiator it's starting to, to emerge, I would say. Um, what are a couple of possibilities? Uh, uh, this is work from uh, a, a colleague of mine uh, within our institution, Jacob Van Etten, and he's been working with emerging citizen science, with genomics, with weather and climate information to develop a series of uh, recommendation uh, uh, trees for crops, depending on the individual circumstances and preferences of the, uh, the uh, farmers themselves. Why can't we get as far as Netflix or, or um, some of these other applications and provide really specific and targeted crop and agronomic recommendations based on the individual circumstances and, uh, and the expected season? Uh, there's, a, there's a really big opportunity here and, and there's already been use of similar approaches um, that, uh, that we use here in, in emulating, for instance, a, a, a Netflix recommender. And then the, uh, the other one uh, that I wanted to call people's attention to and, and sort of put out there as a, a challenge is data-driven policy. Uh, this is uh, this is still emerging, and it's a big opportunity, and, and it's, it's an opportunity for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, th uh, the data that are available tend to be pretty sparse. It's not consistent, either consistent temporal or spatial domain, for for countries around the world. Everybody's context is different, so understanding how to sort of direct and influence policy for the particular challenges that you're facing, and considering that your individual challenges as a country are interconnected uh, globally, uh, uh, there's a real opportunity here. Uh, we've been working a little bit in this area and we're, we're, we're generally heading in this uh, direction. But uh, 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 between these, these sort of very tailored recommendations, the idea that you know, we could have a hay series for a small scale agricultural producer uh, uh, somewhere in the developing world, or that uh, from the other end of the spectrum, we could make smart policy recommendations uh, to, to people concerned about uh, national and regional scale planning. Uh, these are two really big challenges I think would benefit greatly from a lot of smart people and, and uh, good analytics uh, putting their time on task. Uh, I just ask you not to forget who we're working for and, and in a lot of cases many of you are as well. Uh, there's people out there that you know, their livelihoods depend on the decisions that we're helping them take and uh, with that I would say thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk.
Uh, I'd love to take a couple of audience questions. Um, we are running short on time, so uh, we can take as many as, as, as possible, but it will be brief. Um, I'd like to start out by asking, so you're, you're part of the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, CIAT, and the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, CGIAR. What different partners and stakeholders do you work with, and what's the, what's the pipeline for implementation based on the insights that you're generating here? Uh, so th that's a really incredible question, and, and, and uh, thanks for that. Um, it, it depends on the context. So, so our relationships are with any number of, of key stakeholder groups, from individual farmers to farmers associations. For instance, here in Colombia, we work uh, closely with multiple producer associations, scientific bodies. Uh, it could be uh, uh, groups that would be, for instance, the the uh, the national equivalent of maybe the USDA or the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm in the United States. Uh, it could also be uh, uh, international organizations uh, that are are interested in in development and enhancing agriculture systems, whether that's USAID or or a similar development agencies or, um, around the world. Likewise, we work with a number of of uh, uh, donors uh, directly and and bilateral means that that have a a specific interest, for instance, in improving women's inclusion and in decision making, and and will develop approaches to to integrate uh, a, a women into uh, these approaches very very specifically. And then finally, uh, uh, we work with with a variety of uh, of stakeholders who people might not immediately think of. For instance, insurers that are interested in providing crop insurance to farmers in the developing world, but want to do so in a systematic and fair way that's like that's profitable for them, and and likewise supports the 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 uh, farmer communities that uh, that they're trying to work with. So it, it's anybody and everybody, and it's context dependent. Got it. Thank you so much for that really detailed response. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we are going to have to move on, but thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you, David. I'll uh, stick around and, and uh, see what else we have online. Thanks. Awesome. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and maybe Steve will be able to get back to you. There. Sure. Thank you. Um, so we're going to now move on to our next talk by Diane Wu. Um, Diane is the co-founder and CTO of Trace Genomics an interdisciplinary team of bioinformaticians, data scientists, software engineers, and molecular biologists working together to serve the farming community and by analyzing the soil microbiome. She received her PhD in genetics from Stanford University. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's see if we can deal with the, the technology here. Um, are you able to see that? Perfect, yes. One step, at a, one step at a time. Are you able to see that too? Yes, but it's a little bit small for me. It's, um, oh. it's right in the center of there the There we screen. go. Um, okay, thanks. Let me change that up a little bit and do that. How's that? Um, not yet. We can... It's not full screen, and it's also um, just a window, as it were, onto the onto your browser window. Um, maybe try going to View Present, if it's Google Slides, and then there should be an option to share a browser window from um, from Zoom. There. Let's see if that works. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Um, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so in my talk, um, what I'll share a little bit about is the uh, what intensive agriculture has done to the climate, um, how climate change challenges our ability to produce food, and of course, um, how the soil underneath our feet uh, is vitally important in our charge to save our planet. 
So very quickly about me, my background is in machine learning and genomics. Um, I've been working in both fields for over a decade, and I founded Trace Genomics about five years ago. Um, and I'm passionate broadly about the charge to digitize our biological world around us and uh, using high throughput techniques such as genome sequencing, for example, and then applying machine learning techniques to that data to find solutions uh, to tough problems that traditionally have been solved using more analog experimentation at a much smaller scale. So um, diving into the soil, uh, the soil really is alive. And in fact, in every tablespoon of soil, there are uh, millions of microorganisms. Most of them are invisible to the human eye, like fungi and bacteria, um, viruses. Uh, but some of them you can also see, like larger organisms, such as pests and worms and nematodes and things like that. Um, and so if you're interested in reading more about the soil and geeking out about the microbiome, I recommend this book called The Hidden Path of Nature. Um, but this living, breathing ecosystem, uh, and I call it ecosystem because there really are lots of uh, organisms living in there just like in the animal ecosystem. Um, after 50 years of intensive agriculture, farmers have found tools and adopted practices that have really simplified food production, um, boosting yield, uh, making it easier to produce on larger acres. But in that process, unfortunately, some of those uh, practices have thrown this ecosystem off balance. And so the result is that uh, over two thirds of our agricultural soils are actually heavily degraded due to intensive agriculture practices. That means that, um, what, means, what does it mean to be heavily degraded? It means that they're less fertile uh, for food production. They're more susceptible to disease. They are more likely to result in landslides from flooding, uh, loss of topsoil, um, and uh, pollution of our water sources. And it's estimated that if that activity continues, uh, we actually won't be able to farm uh, and grow food on this planet in our soil for more than about 60 years, which is really concerning. Um, and so how do we get here? Uh, and I'll take a step back and kind of explore this problem. Um, well, if you look at a lot of the industrialized techniques that we've adopted in production agriculture uh, over the last few decades, a lot of them are heavily reliant on inputs, uh, inputs like fungicides, pesticides to control for diseases and pests, uh, synthetic fertilizers to boost crop yield. And the excess use of fertilizers, these synthetic fertilizers on degraded soils means that they can't be held by the soil and they can't be taken up by the plant. And so it leaches into groundwater. Um, it dramatically changes our aquatic ecosystem. It pollutes our so water sources and so forth. And it also means that the crop um, uh, is uh, more susceptible to drought as well. And they're more susceptible to flooding because the water holding capacity of the, the soil has decreased. And and um, because the soil also no longer has a diversity of organisms from this excessive use of uh, fungicides and pesticides, um, it also makes them, the crops much more susceptible to invasion from new species uh, because there's not a natural ecosystem already in place uh, to defend um, against the invasion of new species. And so, in fact, uh, plant diseases actually ravage the world constantly, uh, and they cost an estimated economic loss about $137 billion every year. Some famous uh, crop diseases include the Irish potato famine, which killed about a million people, um, the Panama disease that Steve just mentioned earlier that nearly uh, made our bananas extinct. Um, and so with recent monoculture and soil degrading farming practices, um, that actually becomes a bigger problem, and farmers are increasingly need to, needing to fight new emerging diseases for which our crops have fewer uh, defenses. And so, unfortunately, as a result of all this, farming has become more input intensive, more expensive, and more difficult um, with a lot of crop potential that has not been realized. And then taking it from a farmer's perspective, um, farming has also been made more difficult with climate change and the changing weather and precipitation patterns. Um, you know, farm, most farmers get one chance every year to make to do it right. And when those weather conditions are changing so rapidly and the new diseases are emerging so quickly um, and popping up left and right, it's really, really difficult to react 
to that. And um, yet farmers actually need to make a living. And so farmers, uh, you know, like all people, will generally, I think, take the misc mitigation approach in the absence of data. Meaning, if they don't know um, that the soil is diseased or not, if they don't know whether it's fertile or not, they're going to, they can't take the risk of putting in a whole season of hard work uh, of, of dollars and then losing that entire field of crops to disease. So they'll spray with fungicides just in case, and they'll put down excess fertilizers just in case. And um, that's incredibly bad for the microbiome. Uh, you know, if you imagine if you go to the doctor and um, you have a viral infection and they just kind of prescribe you with a broad antibiotic um, without any testing every time, very quickly you're going to start to develop um, antibiotic resistance. You're going to lose all of your beneficial microorganisms in your gut. And so the same concept applies to the soil. And meanwhile, by the way, you're also your viral infection is still ravaging and, and spreading. And so the problem just gets worse all, on all fronts. And it sounds crazy to think about, but actually that's, that's what farmers are dealing with today. Um, but all this uh, can be changed because if we're able to surface data on the organisms that live in the soil, on the disease risk, on the nutrient and water holding uh, potential of the soil, um, and help farmers identify the specific deficiencies and imbalances in their soil, then the farmer can actually make uh, decisions to build soil resilience uh, against emerging diseases. And uh, they can take a specific uh, approach rather than taking a blanket uh, risk mitigation approach. And the, the other important is aspect is that they can actually do this before they even put a plant into the ground. So rather than waiting for a disease to show up on the plant and then trying to treat it, they can actually prevent that disease before uh, planting the crop. And that's because the soil um, actually has the best memory of everything that happened on that ground. Uh, in the past, and it's also the best predictor of everything that's going to come out of that ground in the future. And um, because pathogens are crop specific uh, and they attack specific crops, uh, farmers, if they see a pathogen, can choose to plant a different crop. And um, in some cases, it can actually be more economical to not plant anything at all and leave that uh, ground fallow than to plant something, put an entire season of effort, and then lose all of it at the end of the season to the disease. And um, interestingly, the soil uh, may actually be the key to solving um, not just the challenges on a single farm, but also maybe one of the solutions to our global problem. Um, the soil can actually serve as a carbon sink and sequester carbon from uh, the atmosphere. And in fact, the USDA uh, already has plans to help farms and forests sequester uh, or offset an extra 120 million um, uh, tons of uh, CO2 by 2025. Um, the problem with a lot of these efforts, long-term soil health, sustainability, um, and organic efforts, is that it's actually really hard to see the um, effects of those practices on the soil um, until much later. And so it's hard to promote these long-term initiatives um, with fewer short-term measurements. And so our mission at TRACE Genomics is to save our living soil by making it really easy for a farmer to see into the soil, uh, the living soil on every field. So when a farmer uh, senses a soil sample, we take that soil sample and we extract the DNA um, out of that sample, the DNA that from the millions of uh, fungi and bacteria that are in that sample. We take that DNA and we chop it up into a bunch of little pieces. Uh, and we use a DNA sequencer to read uh, the output of the, the, each of those little fragments. And then um, we use machine learning and bioinformatics to decode those millions of DNA fragments uh, and identify the organisms in the original sample uh, using a database of organisms. And then finally, uh, we incorporate the physical and chemical aspects of the soil, which are also very important, uh, the environmental conditions of the farm, uh, and we help the farmer interpret all that data. So like, what does it mean for the crop if you have a certain microbe in the soil? Um, what can you do to increase the resilience of your soils and the health of your crops? And so um, closing loop there. So now I'm going to dive a little bit into uh, you know, the machine learning and uh, some of the bioinformatics problems uh, that we're trying to solve. Uh, namely, how do you take a file 
um, that's generated from a sample of millions of DNA sequences, DNA fragments representing supposedly the organisms in the soil sample and interpret it to inform agricultural decisions. So uh, in one approach, uh, and this is bioinformatics, where you take the DNA sequence and you try to figure out what uh, organism it belongs to by comparing it across thousands of organisms in a database. Uh, from there, you are then able to potentially identify microbial interactions. Uh, and ultimately, what you want to do is predict the state of that soil. So is it going to be a disease soil? Is it going to be a highly productive soil? But it doesn't stop there because it doesn't actually help the farmer um, just to know if their field is going to have high or low yield. They need to know how to actually change uh, that predicted outcome. And so you want to start to build model interpretability uh, and learn the biological and functional representation states of the soil. Those can include disease risk, um, nutrient holding potential, carbon sequestration, and so forth. And then finally, we want to connect those soil states to um, farming decisions like uh, fertilizer application or crop rotation and help the farmer identify ways to build their soil health while preventing disease. So next I'll go over um, some high level uh, data challenges in this process and I won't have enough time to go into the details of any of them, but hopefully um, this will give you an appreciation for some of the interesting challenges of working with the microbiome. Uh, data sets and to influence changes in behavior uh, for farmers. Uh, some of these challenges are shared uh, across different machine learning problems. Uh, some are unique to agriculture and some are uh, unique to the soil microbiome. So one of the biggest challenges that we face is that the challenge isn't actually defined for us. Um, we know we want to influence farming decisions. We know we want to try to improve um, climate change and improve the health of the soil, but how do you do that? Um, defining the objective function is actually one of the most difficult problems because you can very easily overpromise and underdeliver and lose user trust in the system uh, from a user who already doesn't trust technology. Uh, and you can very easily also overwhelm the user with complex analytics such that they don't understand what's going on at all uh, when they're busy going out into the field and trying to farm. And so in, you know, in the most simple case, an extreme case, you could say, well, just tell me how to farm, tell me what to do in my field every day. Um, but of course that doesn't work because uh, every crop is farmed differently. Every region has different regional practices. Um, some are regulatory and some are, are um, just convention. Uh, every farmer has their own goals. Uh, some are organic farmers, some are conventional farmers. And uh, there are also a lot of decisions on the farm that are not captured by the system. Some farmers are just better at practicing uh, farming and applying the same techniques as other farmers. And so in addition to all that, uh, you know, the farmer might just not believe you if you try to tell them that you know how to farm better than they do and, and better than their grandparents uh, does. So we actually spend a lot of time thinking about how to frame the problem and how to understand the human computer uh, interaction and letting the farmer do what they do best and building a model to help them predict and triage risk, uh, but also being tolerant of model error. Um, another challenge um, that I think a lot of folks face in agriculture is, but especially with the soil, and is that the soil sample is taken at the beginning of the season before planting. Uh, that's how it's able to be so predictive. But um, after it's been taken at that one point in time, there are a lot of unmeasured variables that happen across that season. Um, a lot of uh, unpredictable weather and rainfall. And of course, there's um, you know differences in, in the quality of work. So uh, uh, in, in, in farming, and so validating that model becomes really quite tricky uh, and time-consuming. And crops get diseases not just because of the pathogen, but because of the what we call the disease triangle: the pathogen, the host, uh, and the environment. And all of that's very important. Um, and uh, but there are, of course, methods to try to model uh, those uh, un unobserved variables. Um, and that's also related to the challenge of getting labeled data as well. Um, it takes an entire year to get labeled uh, yield data for most crops in agriculture, which is super expensive. Uh, so it's important to try to do things like ingesting remote sensing data, um, uh, like satellite imagery, in order to estimate yield losses. But that's also tricky, too, because um, a lot of crops, uh, you can't actually estimate the yield using the biomass, which you can see from the sky. So crops like uh, apples, orchards, 
um, the biomass actually isn't predictive of yield. And so um, labeling, uh, as I'm alluding to, becomes even greater challenge when you're dealing with dozens of crops, different regions. Um, some of those crops have reliable labels, others don't. And um, of course, but of course there are several uh, unsupervised and semi-supervised um, approaches that can be applied to that problem because, as I mentioned earlier, microbes actually interact in ecosystems and communities. So that they actually form um, symbiotic and antagonistic relationships with each other. And many of those relationships are common across each acre of soil, regardless of what crop uh, goes into that ground. And so we can leverage those relationships and those, um, and those patterns in the soil. Um, one challenge that is uh, unique to microbiome analysis and that, that I find particularly uh, fascinating is that um, some species of microbes behave much more similarly to other species of microbes, uh, to each other than to other species of microbes. And that's because um, different strains of microbes have basically evolved from one another. And so there, and there's both convergent evolution as well as divergent evolution happening. And so if you treat the abundance of each strain as uh, a feature and a vector, you actually lose a lot of that um, phylogenetic structure, that evolutionary structure and the evolutionary relationship between these different microbes. And so um, encoding that structure into your models is actually uh, quite useful because we're not generally dealing with a ton of data. Um, Another really big challenge is that microbiome analysis is not deterministic. Um, less than 50% of soil microbes have ever been sequenced um, um, or cultured. And so a lot of the sequences we see, we have no idea where it's from. And um, even the ones that have been sequenced, a lot of the functionality uh, can drift over time. A lot of the annotation uh, is incomplete. And so there's real value in building predictive models that can actually incorporate the raw DNA sequences themselves rather than being completely reliant on um, bioinformatics algorithms. And um, finally, all the modeling we do, um, it needs to be interpretable because if you build a model that's wonderful and accurate and impressive, but no one uses it, uh, you have to ask if it really mattered. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to model the state of the soil in a way that helps the farmer um, identify the best course of action to improve that soil. So we need to convince them to change their action. And so um, we want to try to involve the farmer to become citizen scientists on their own farms um, and work with us to unravel the mystery of the soil microbiome together. Uh, and when we succeed in doing so, this is just a case study, farmers make more money, they get higher yields, um, they choose more sustainable solutions that are better for the planet, uh, like microbials, uh, to boost nutrient uptake rather than uh, killing everything in the soil. And uh, we end up getting more nutritious foods uh, delivered to uh, our grocery stores. And so uh, together with farmers, uh, farm by farm, we hope to rebuild our soils to reverse the effects of climate change and to produce more abundant, nutritious food for a growing population. Thank you so much for that terrific talk. Um, let's take a couple of audience questions. We have one question um, asking whether there is work done looking at farms that seem to be doing well, not as susceptible as to disease, not using pesticides, continued fertility for long amounts of time, and measuring their soil microbiome and the effects of their practices. For example, biodynamic farms, farms that are, are uh, rotating what they're planting um, and have strict rules for, for what, how they cycle through different crops. Also, indigenous land use practices. Um, is there work done on looking at this and potentially going to those practices, uh, indeed not necessarily using ML first um, after, after assessing what is working well? Yeah, so what uh, you're alluding to is the fact that, you know, there are a lot of um, farms that farmers will call suppressive farms. All of their neighbors will get disease and they won't get a disease. Um, there are certain farmers uh, who every year uh, win these yield awards. Um, so they have yield competitions with each other. And there are some farmers who consistently win that. Um, and there are some farms where people know this, you don't have to put any fertilizer in the soil and that crop will get a high yield. So there are natural processes in the soil 
um, that make that those nutrients available to the plant without addition of synthetic fertilizers. And so farmers know that. Um, and the, and the problem with with uh, farming is that we want to change the behavior of the the, mo the biggest group of farmers to really make a big impact on soil health. And um, they need to be able to relate to um, those farmers. And, and, and there are different, you know, practices and conventions of farming. And so generally what we try to do is not compare um, the, the really high performing farms uh, to the regular conventional farm because there's so many microbial and uh, management practices that are different between those farms, but rather take uh, one person's farm and generally one farm spans, you know, in corn, so being uh, thousands of acres. Uh, and compare across different fields on that same farm and say, how is your highest performing field different from your lowest performing field? And what are you doing differently? And highlighting that to help them see what the next step is on their own farm and slowly one by uh, step by step, um, helping them get to the sort of that um, balance of, of their ecosystem. Got it. Thank you. Uh, one more question from the audience, and then I think we do have to move on. Are there any proxies where we may already have the data for soil health? For example, can you use crop yields and data on inputs, fertilizer, pesticides, et cetera, to predict soil health? Yeah, so there's, um, there are a lot of efforts around the soil health movement, um, and there are uh, both physical and chemical measurements of soil health as well. So it's not just a biological aspect, um, the Got physical it. aspect matters a lot, the structure. And so uh, there are a lot of groups that are working on soil health. Uh, farmers sometimes will just smell the soil to see if it's alive with <laughs> organisms. Um, but what we're really trying to do is unpack the biological aspect of soil health and help farmers understand how those microbes are, are working in that ecosystem. Fantastic. Uh, so there are a couple more audience questions. Perhaps you could address those in the chat in a response from a previous questioner. Um, thank you so much again for speaking. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. Subit Chakrabarti is a senior data scientist at Indigo Ag, a Boston-based agricultural technology startup that is creating seed treatments to optimize agricultural yields. His work focuses on the development of novel spatio temp I'm sorry, uh, novel uh, spatio uh, temporal machine learning methods applicable for large-scale earth imagery. Subit received his PhD in agricultural engineering from University of Florida. Thank you so much for joining us. And yes, we can see your screen fine. We can't currently hear you. Well, I was muted, so I think that was the problem. <laughs> can you hear me now? We can hear you fine. Welcome. Okay, great. So my name is Subit, and I'm a data scientist at Indigo on the Geo Innovation team. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'm really going to talk about what we do on the Geo Innovation team. So there's a lot of other authors, everyone on my team, essentially. And uh, at Indigo, we what we do is ask a lot of questions, and that's how we that's how we grow. Essentially, we first and foremost try to help farmers by answering the questions we ask. Uh, answer them with microbiology, data science, remote sensing, and information technology. And we think that when we are done answering all these questions, and you know, there's a ton of questions, more than we have time to talk about uh, today, uh, we envision an agricultural system that is beneficial for the environment, uh, because without that, as Diane said, there will be no farming, and we'll run, off, we'll run, run out of food in our, our lifetimes, right? Uh, so the first question is, do we need to change anything? And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, agricultural production systems in developed countries are, uh, you know, leading cause of climate change and we have to do something about it. Um, but that doesn't mean we need farmers to farm less, you know, quite the opposite, because of course we need to feed uh, 7 billion people today and 2 billion more by, by 2030. Uh, so the next question is, what can we change? Uh, how can we change agricultural production systems? Uh, to actually help us in the fight against climate change. And that might seem like an absurd idea, but remember that uh, plants are carbon. And no, the density of carbon is not much, certainly less than say like a tropical forest, 
but when plants grow, they literally pull carbon dioxide out of the air and uh, store it in their cellular structures, right? And they do it again and again every single year as we keep farming because we need to eat. So this is what we are fighting. Uh, the change in carbon dioxide from free industrial levels to today is give or take 1 trillion tons. Not exactly 1 trillion tons, but that figure looks far better in slides than 0 0.936485 or, you know, like you guys get the idea. So uh, coincidentally, the difference between the average carbon content between pre-agricultural revolution land, so that's going back a little bit farther, and today is also about a trillion tons. And uh, so the next slide is going to show a map across history of the carbon storage potential in agricultural lands. And as you can see, the, the potential at the beginning of you know, in the, industry, the farming revolution was pretty low because we couldn't add more carbon to forests, but then it keeps increasing as we convert uh, forests, wetlands, and peatlands into farmland. And we keep losing carbon, and most of that loss has ended up directly uh, or indirectly into the atmosphere. And that's where we are today. We have lots of ag regions with lots of farming, but not a lot of carbon storage. And some parts like the Yangtze River Basin in China and the Ganges River Basin in India are really, really over farmed. So that brings up us to the next question, which is that if we need to bring about change, we need to know existing practices. And to a geographer, that means map existing practices. And we need to incentivize farmers to change because obviously, you know, farming is a business and, you know, they, they need to make a profit and it's a very difficult business at that. The Geo-Innovation team at Indigo focuses on the first part, which is mapping those practices. So what practices are we looking for? Well, a lot. Okay, frankly, there's an overwhelming number of factors. For example, yes, crops are carbon and when they die, they go into the soil. But when you till the soil, you lose a lot of that carbon. So tillage is important. But why do we till in the first place? Well, we can't plant crop after crop of corn without tillage. So rotation is an important practice. And maybe you don't need to till if you have cover crops. So cover crops is important. So that's a lot of factors. And when a physical agronomist uh, or a soil scientist sees these factors and complicated interactions, they go immediately, aha, I smell a model here. But to model that, we need to map it which brings us back to the crop type mapping. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to devote most of my time into how we do that in the US and hopefully time permitting, show you a few other vignettes of uh, what we map. Uh, so what, what do we know about crops in the US? Uh, turns out not much until the next year. So at the farm level in January, USDA releases a huge map called the cropland data layer, but the agronomists and soil scientists who model the soil want that information way before that time. They want it now, right? Of course, we haven't even begun planting now in most of the country, but the agronomists still want it now. So I tell them, well, not now, but I can definitely use machine learning to get it to you before January. Uh, there are a few major challenges. Uh, one of the first ones is that unlike land cover classes, crop spectral signatures are remarkably similar. Uh, so I lived in, on a farm in the Midwest for three months for my PhD, but really if you show me an updated drone, drone image of corn and soybean, I cannot tell them apart, let alone a satellite image. Plus there is a resolution and a scale problem like in everything else on my right. So to solve that, we do the thing that you'd do probably, which is build a CNN and an RNN, which you are working on right now, but that's not mature. So let's talk about the CNN. Uh, it's pretty simple. It takes satellite imagery and labels from the USDS cropland data layer from past years and trains a network to predict those for this year. Simple, right? So a little complication is that we have spectral and temporal layers. So we can discretize the years into say, for example, three phases and make a different network after each phase with cascading accuracies. As you can imagine, the accuracy after the growing season is much greater than the accuracy just after planting. And I tell the agronomists we'll have the map ready by end of July, which is after the second period in the figure. So that's how our production models are trained. In addition to the spectral and temporal layers, we have a few more layers. Uh, just as an aside, we don't use imagery directly. We use a lot of masking and filters and more filters. And then we use a Gaussian process regression to combine low spatial resolution, high temporal resolution, modus imagery with high spatial resolution, low temporal resolution, landside imagery to create a merged product that is less affected by clouds, which you know are common in, in temperate regions, 
and it gets gets a bit, bit more detailed than you know the coarse resolution satellite pixels. So you can see the the merging going on uh, in the images on the left. On the right, uh, it shows you the a single pixel across time in a growing season, and you can see that the crop uh, greens up, matures, and then senesces. Uh, but the curve is not super smooth, the curve in orange, because nature, right? So we fit a parametric model in blue to those observations, which is smooth and nice, but not at all natural. But what we want from that blue curve is the dates shown in red and blue, and we get that by inverting the curve. And for each pixel, we feed in those dates uh, into the network as well. And that gives us a sense of timing. This is the network. It has convolution layers with a relatively high kernel size. I think we use 500 uh, pixels at 30 meters, which kind of approximates a farm size in the US. So that's where that comes from. There's an activation layer, a max pooling layer, a batch norm. And then the reduction is mostly in the spectral slash temporal dimension. So we reduced the third dimension to about six or so and trained the network against our six dimensional one hot encoded crop classes. And uh, the architecture on the right is what we use uh, to train the models you know, across a large region. Uh, it uses a very cool package called Horovod, which uses open source uh, you know, parallel training. And it runs on top of OpenMPI, so it lets us train on multiple machines with multiple GPUs. This by itself can be another talk, so please ask me questions if you want more details. Uh, so let's quickly go through some results. This is uh, Kansas in 2019. This is uh, the true crop types. And let me tell you, 2019 was a difficult year. I'll tell you why. But you know, before that, let's look at what the predicted crops are. So that is a predicted crop on July 15th, mid-season. Doesn't look too bad. But let's zoom in. So we are going to look at the results in that little center red dot in the middle of Kansas. So here it is. You can see the predicted map is smoother than the actual map. And there are a few errors, right? But if you can't see the errors, here they are. Uh, most of the errors are uh, most of the errors are essentially due to uh, the flooding that happened in the Midwest last year, which you might have read about. Uh, there was quite a bit of flooding, and usually corn has to be planted in a certain window of time, and anything after that window, if the window passes, farmers will plant soybean, right? So because of the floods, there was delayed planting, and the farmers should have planted soybean, but if you remember, our president was waging a trade war against China and the price of soybeans was at an all-time low. So a lot of farmers planted other crops and corn anyway after the date had passed. Uh, so when the network saw that the crops were late, they were like, aha, I see soybean, but it was not soybean. So the soybean precision is, is, is really, really low. Uh, and it brings up a broader question of how do we train for these shifts in underlying statistics and regime changes? Uh, because, you know, these things change every year. Uh, right now, corn prices are at an all-time low because the oil price is at an all-time low. And so ethanol plants have no demand. But how do we include that prior information into our models? If you have any ideas, please let me know. Uh, so here's a few vignettes. So... Again, as I said, the floods in the Midwest were really bad last year, and understanding the frequency and extent of flooding is, is really useful. So we do that using uh, you know, data fusion. So this shows you the flooded extent, the crops that would have been planted if it was not flooded, uh, and the unflooded imagery. And on the right, you see uh, in orange the, the planting dates, and in, and in blew the uh, senescent states. And you can see that in 2019, it was all shifted by a lot because of that Midwestern flooding. Uh, another thing that we map is, is cover crops. So cover crops are very important uh, to soil carbon content. And we, we do that by spanning, you know, like a phenology sequence for multiple years, and then trying to do these peak detection algorithms uh, and, you know, and classified the peaks into some categories like not planted or similar to a year we have seen in the past or dissimilar to a year we have seen in the past or maybe likely cover crop, which is the thing that we actually want. And we map those things as well. So these are just a few of the things uh, that we do at Indigo Geo Innovation. And what question should we ask next? Let me know if you have any ideas. Thanks.
Fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, for those who are interested more, a few of our speakers, including you, have mentioned Sentinel data. If you're interested um, in Sentinel data more, I do encourage you to check out our remote sensing session, which will happen uh, in two days on the 30th, where we will have Gregor Milshinsky, who works on Sentinel Hub, um, on That's making great. all of that data available. So I encourage the audience to check out the session on Thursday on cross-cutting methods and specifically remote sensing within that. Um, so I'd like to start out by asking, I'm curious about the, the stakeholders and clients that you're working with and how the output of your continents gets translated into impact on the ground. Uh, totally. So our clients essentially is, is farmers, right? So, so one of the core businesses that we have is uh, we pay farmers to add carbon to their soil. And we we convert them into credits and you can find more documentation about how we can how we construct a carbon credit online and it has to be certified by another, by another agency so there's a whole process but essentially we try to measure carbon in the soil and farms and we pay farmers to add carbon in the soil and that's that's the essential stakeholders that we work with um if you are a farmer uh, and if you if you consider adopting uh, region practices like no-till or using cover crops, then then obviously you know it it means more of an effort for you, right? Like the biggest benefit of using a lot of inputs is that you can kind of just like do your thing every year the same and forget about your farm. But when you're using region practices, you have to really take care of the soil. You have to take care of you know diseases, and you know part of it was mentioned by Diane before. Uh, so what we do is we pay farmers to add carbon to the soil, to adopt region practices, and we pay them by using credit, carbon credit money that we get from other big organizations who want to offset their carbon emissions. Uh, and the geo-innovation team, what we do is essentially try to map these practices so we have a better idea of uh, you know, which part of the country is more uh, leaning towards shifting to region agriculture so that we can like you know, talk to farmers and so on and so forth. Awesome, thank you. A question from the audience. What is the spatial resolution uh, for this? How large a piece of farmland is being predicted? So we do two types of predictions. One is at a farm scale. So if you, if you predict at the farm scale, you obviously need to have a delineation first that delineates the satellite image into farms. So that's, that's separate. For that, we have an area threshold of uh, 10 acres. So everything greater than, every farm greater than 10 acres, we'll have a, a prediction for. But this is per pixel. And then here, each pixel is um, 20 meters. That's the sentinel resolution. So we have a prediction for every 20 meter, 20 meter pixel in the US. Got it. Another question. Do they have and consider various different cropping systems during their mapping? Yeah, we do. We totally do. So that's a great question. So um, at this point of time, nothing has been planted yet, but a lot of farmers follow a set cropping pattern, like they'll have two crop crops of corn and then one crop of soybean or something like that. And, and we do have a model that takes these cropping patterns and predicts the most probable crop that the, uh, that the farmer will have planted if nothing else happens. Now, a lot of other factors come, come into play. So a farmer might deviate from a cropping pattern because of you know, the prices of corn or soybean or because he can't access the field before a certain time, or you know, there's like other externalities that, that we, have to, uh, we have to kind of model. But essentially we do consider cropping patterns across the US as one of the predictors. Fantastic. One last more technical question. Could you elaborate on Gaussian process regression for fusing images? Is it related to the level of data you're using? So, uh, frankly, I don't know a lot about that part. It's done by uh, a guy called Doug Bolton. But essentially what it does is, is it combines uh, a smooth time series, which is the, the modus imagery, and then a time series that's not as smooth. Uh, and it combines them to give you like the most, the maximum likelihood estimate, I think, uh, at the end. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, a merged image. Well, perhaps the questioner can, can reach out uh, offline if they're interested. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I also have like papers that I can point awesome. to. Awesome. Fantastic. That. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you again for joining us. This was a real pleasure.
No problem. I'm going to stick around and because I really like all the presentations so far. Great job. Awesome. Uh, so we are going to move on to the last talk in this session now. Uh, that will be by Tsarina Kapitanovich, um, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington and a member of Microsoft FarmBeats. FarmBeats enables data-driven farming by integrating AI, edge devices, and Internet of Things for agriculture. Um, and Serena received her bachelor's in EECS from University of Washington. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you fine. We can see you too. Cool. And... Slides are very clear. Awesome. So... It's all yours. Great. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I'm excited to be part of the workshop. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Microsoft's FarmBeats project, uh, which is an AI and IoT platform for data-driven agriculture. Uh, we started this project in 2015 with our key motivator to help solve the world's food problem. So I'm sure most of you guys are sort of already aware of this, but one of the most common statistics you'll hear nowadays is we need to increase the world's food production by 70% in order to feed the growing population by 2050. Um, and this can be really, really difficult because it's not just about feeding the world, but it's also about providing nutritional food and doing it in a sustainable way. That is, the resources that we rely on for food production are starting to diminish. So water levels are receding, the amount of arable land is going down. So how can we solve this problem in a sustainable way? And not only this, but the agriculture industry employs over 30% of global workers, and most of them don't make enough money. So also, how can we make the farmer's life better, and how can we provide these solutions in an affordable way? So fortunately, agriculture researchers have spent a lot of work trying to solve this problem. Uh, and they found a promising solution known as data-driven agriculture. The uh, idea is, for example, if this is my farm and I want to irrigate, using traditional farming practices, what we would do is just apply water uniformly across the entire field. And what data-driven agriculture has shown is that this isn't really the best approach. Instead, what we want to do is actually first measure soil moisture across the entire field and then apply water accordingly. And this has been shown to improve yield, reduce cost, and ensure sustainability. So the problem is, is that these solutions have actually been around for over a decade and they're still sparsely adopted in today's farming practices. The reasoning behind this is due to the high cost of existing solutions. So for instance, leading solutions can have a price of $8,000 just for a few sensors with the recurring cost. For most farmers, investing in such a system is a huge risk and just not affordable. So our goal with FarmBeats is to enable affordable data-driven agriculture solutions. And when we think about this, what we really want to do is find an efficient way to collect data about the farm and in turn provide um, insights. And usually what comes to mind is why don't we develop an IoT system? We've already built such systems like the Google Home or Amazon Echo, so can we just take these concepts and extend them over to agriculture. We could put sensors out in the field to collect data, the data can be sent to the cloud, and then in turn we provide insights to enable precision irrigation or precision spraying. But unfortunately it's not that simple, it's actually really difficult to deploy outdoor IOT systems, especially in resource constrained environments. Specifically there's four key challenges that we usually try to address. It's no internet connectivity, lack of power, um, how can you provide accurate data uh, while minimizing cost, and also even if you have connectivity, it's usually really slow. So the first problem, no internet connectivity. Um, most farms are located in rural areas, so 
there's usually little to no internet connectivity. Even if there is, it's usually a weak connection and often it's hindered by weather or dense crop canopy. The second problem relates to cost. That is, it, you want to have an accurate representation of soil moisture, for instance. And usually you would need a vast amount of sensors to do that, even just for a small farm. This makes the system too expensive, it's difficult to maintain, and it also gets in the way of the farmer's daily tasks. Third, even if the farmer does have access to internet, it's usually very slow and a weak connection, so it's not broadband. And in other words, all of the data that you're trying to collect, uh, it would be extremely time consuming to get this to the cloud, and there's no way that you, could be able, you would be able to provide insights in real time. And lastly, most farms don't have any power and you need power to, you know, power on these sensors, power on all these devices that you're using to collect this data, get the data to the cloud. So we need a solution to provide power on the farm. So in this talk, what I'm going to go through is how FarmBeats addresses all four of these challenges and finish up with um, some of the deployments that we've done and a few applications that we've enabled. So we can start from the top. How do we enable internet connectivity on the farm? Let's say that the farmer has connectivity at his home or office, and that allows us to ship data to the cloud. But that internet connectivity can't reach the farm, which could be several miles away and obstructed by dense crop canopy. So we need some type of solution that can extend the coverage from the farmer's home all the way to the farm. FarmBeats uses a technology developed out of Microsoft called TV White Spaces to bridge this gap. So TV White Spaces are unused TV spectrum. So when you're watching TV and flipping through local TV channels and you come across a channel that's just noise, that's actually unused TV spectrum that we can leverage to extend connectivity over to the farm. And what's really nice about TV white spaces is that it's great for enabling connectivity in rural areas because there's a lot of unused TV channels. They operate in the lower frequency ranges, so that means that they can travel very long distances and also through dense crop canopy. So what we do is set up a TV white space base station um, in, on the farm. And that allows us to take the nearest source of connectivity and extend it all the way over to the farm field to connect all of the devices. So now all the data that we're collecting can be streamed to the cloud over the TV white space network. So we solved a connectivity problem. The next challenge is limited resources and cost. We need to work with a sparse sensor deployment because we wanna have one, a low cost deployment, and two, too many devices out in the farm field would be a hindrance for the farmer. But with only a few devices deployed, how can we maintain high accuracy when mapping out the field? Our idea is to use drones to enhance spatial coverage. An off-the-shelf drone can cost around $1,000 and it's automatic. It covers large areas quickly and it can collect visual data. So we want to combine this visual data from the UAVs with the sensor data from the farm. What we do is we take a drone and we have it fly over the farm field. We configure the camera attached to the drone to collect videos. And using this, we use this structure from motion pipeline to construct a 3D point cloud representation of the entire farm, which we then use to stitch orthomosaics, or in other words, panoramic overviews of the entire farm field. And we can do this uh, process with RGB and multispectral imagery as well. So with the drone, we generate this panoramic overview and we combine it with the sparse sensor data. Now using machine learning and vision algorithms, we can create precision heat maps of soil moisture or temperature and pH and so forth and provide this to farmers. So the idea is now the farmer can actually take this precision heat map and 
look at the, let's say, soil moisture map and say, okay, I only need to irrigate in these areas of the farm. So one challenge is that we actually want to make this technology available for all farmers. And in some areas, for instance, developing countries, cost and regulation might get in the way of having access to a drone. So to take the same technology to farms in Africa or India, we have come up with a low tech and low cost solution that we call uh, the tethered eye or tie for short. What we do is we take a latex balloon, we fill it up with helium, uh, and since smartphones are now more accessible, we attach that um, to the balloon and they have cameras, right? So it looks something like this. And what we do is walk through the farm field, balloon in hand, and collect the same images that a drone would. And with that, we can stitch these same panoramic overviews. Um, they're not gonna be as perfect if you're using a drone, but you can still provide the same insights. So I wanna go into a little more detail about how we actually generate the precision heat maps. So if we have this orthomosaic of the farm and we have several sensors deployed out in the farm field and they could be collecting soil moisture or temperature data. Uh, and we also know the lat long of each sensor location. So this can then be considered ground truth for each of those points. And we also know the RGB values or other spectral values corresponding to each point. And this data is then used to train our machine learning model where we use Gaussian processes. And then we use that to then interpolate the data of all parts of the farm. So our method is based on two key insights. The first is spatial smoothness. That is, if two parts of the farm are close to each other, then they're likely to have similar values. And second is spatial similarity. So if we have two farms that look similar to each other in RGB, multispectral, or hyperspectral imagery, then they're likely to have similar values. And so we use this to train the machine learning model to predict values in all other parts of the farm. So to summarize, we treat this as a machine learning problem and by using the aerial imagery and the sensor data together, we can create precision heat maps of the farm, such as precision moisture maps or precision pH maps. So this is sort of how we solve the cost problem and minimize the amount of devices that we need in the farm. The second challenge is slow connectivity. So, or third challenge, uh, we solve the connectivity issue on the farm by using TV white spaces to extend coverage. But the local connection that we're relying on, let's say at the farmer's home, is, can still be a weak connection and it can be prone to weather related outages. Uh, we've actually had a scenario where the system went completely down for a week because of weather. So we need a way to provide insights to the farmer even if the system goes offline. What, we cut, what we've come up with is called uh, the Farm Beats Gateway, where we have an edge device sitting at the farmer's home, which could just be a laptop PC. And everything in the gray box that you see is running on the PC. So the sensor data is sent over the TV white spaces and is processed at the edge. We perform local computation to generate the orthomosaics and the heat maps. And with, with this, we can then provide um, all of the insights previously me mentioned locally. And now, instead of sending gigabytes of data to the cloud, we're only sending kilobyte summaries. And of course, this allows the system to run online. So if we do have a weak connection, you're not trying to send all of the drone imagery and all of the sensor data. And of course, when you do have an improved connection, you can start sending more of the data up to the cloud, which allows us to do things like cross-farm analytics. And so the last challenge I want to talk about is power on the farm. Um, so usually if you don't have power, the most obvious solution that you want to go with is probably solar, right? Um, and you have all these really power consuming devices. So the TV white space base station, you know, IP cameras, uh, Wi-Fi routers, uh, these are all really power consuming. So when we were first setting up farm beats, we set up this sort of solar hub that powers all of these devices. 
And um, so I'm located in Seattle. It's usually really cloudy here. It worked fairly well for the first few months of summer, but you know, once the cloudy weather started coming in, the system just goes completely down. And that's sort of a bottleneck. Uh, so what we've come up with is a smart weather aware duty cycling system. So the system monitors uh, battery life and cloud cover. And based off of that information, we actually duty cycle the system accordingly. So for instance, um, if the cloud coverage is really high for some day, we will actually duty cycle the system to maybe keep it on for one hour and then turn it off for two hours. That's just one example. And our initial results show that we can actually increase the on time from four cloudy days to 30. And actually over recent years, we've been able to keep the system completely online for uh, the entire year and maybe once or twice it'll go down, but it's able to self recover. So that's sort of how we address all of these different challenges at a high level. Uh, the next thing I want to go into is discussing sort of some of the deployments that we've done so far and the different applications that we've had. Uh, so we have farm beats deployments deployed all across the US. Uh, I don't think this map shows all of them, but a lot of deployments in Washington State, California, Wisconsin, um, India, China, Africa, Chile. Um, so with our deployments, we work with farms that really vary in size. They can range from five to several, like tens of thousands of acres. Uh, we use a variety of sensors, essentially any sensor that's available off the shelf you can integrate with the FarmBeat system. This image that you see on the slide is actually one of the sensor boxes. So that is what gets deployed out in the field. You can actually see the wind speed and direction sensors, and then you have sensors going down into the ground. Um, and this is all powered by solar. So one of the applications I wanna talk about is microclimate forecasting. So can we provide uh, microclimate predictions. For instance, uh, what is the soil moisture going to be like in the next five days? What we did here was we took data from 50 different weather stations within Washington State and um, this is over the last seven years at 15 minute intervals and we used this to train a machine learning model in conjunction with the data that the farm beat system collects to make microformat uh, microclimate forecasting predictions. So the farmer can use these insights for several applications, uh, for instance, precision spraying or deciding when he or she needs to till the field. So what you're seeing here in this plot is for soil moisture and temperature, uh, the average percentage error for three different machine learning models that we developed. The pink bars show that the area is less than 10%, even for predicting five days in advance. And so we're also using this to predict things that we're not monitoring. You could predict uh, evapotranspiration or leaf wetness based off of these sensor values. Uh, the second thing I wanna show you is an example panorama that we stitched together. Uh, for one section of a farm field. Uh, this is a farm in upstate New York. Um, and this farmer basically does everything. Uh, he has, uh, you know, cattle, grows uh, greens, uh, dairy, uh, all sorts of stuff. And just by using the panoramas that we stitched together for him, he can have actionable insights immediately. So for instance, when you zoom into the panorama, you can see things like this water puddle. Uh, it's actually really large. This is something that he wants to know about right away. If he doesn't go out and fix it, that part of the field is rendered useless for the rest of the year. Um, things like cow poop, uh, he can sort of track um, where his cows are moving. Um, are they pooping? Are they healthy? Uh, where are they? Is there a stray cow? You can even see um, when you look at it uh, where they've been grazing so you can tell when they need to be moved to the next field. 
Uh, this is an example panorama of a farm in Washington State. This is actually our first deployment site. Um, and this little box that you see there is where our solar uh, station is. And you can kind of see the solar panels, but it's hard to tell. Uh, and this is a precision heat map for soil moisture. So this map we actually provide, along with all the other insights we provide to the farmers through a web UI and also a smartphone app so they can look at these maps and make decisions uh, about, you know, how they want to irrigate or how they want to, you know, deal with pH. Uh, so this, just to talk about that, like this is an example. Oh, sorry, that should actually say pH. Um, so this is an example of a pH map uh, for the same farm. So this farmer, what he does is he actually, um, to change the pH levels of the farm, he will apply uh, lime on the farm. And usually what he does is just, you know, throw some out there and he has to wait and see um, you know, after it rains how much um, the pH levels have changed. Using this map, he can actually decide where he wants to put the lime and how much he should put down. Next thing I want to show you is an idea of how accurate we are. So this plot is showing how accurate the actual sensor that we used was. So the actual temperature sensor was reporting temperature in one degree Fahrenheit in units of 0.2. And what we're claiming here is not that we are more or less accurate than the sensors themselves, but that these values are so close to ground truth that they're actionable by the farmer. Uh, some other applications beyond field monitoring is actually storage monitoring. So one of the biggest losses for farmers is actually in storage. So when you're storing produce, meat, dairy, uh, you want to have a very specific environment. Um, and one of the problems is, is that at least for a specific farmer that we've worked with is an employee will go into the storage room and you know maybe the door wasn't closed all the way and then the temperature goes down and then a lot of the uh, products perish. So we take our system and also deploy it in these areas and monitor things like temperature. So you can see a spike uh, in temperature which tells us that the door is open. That's when a farmer will actually um, get a notification and they can go deal with it. Another application is uh, sort of detecting cows. And this is sort of, this is still like very much in the research phase. And the idea is here to, to detect animals um, and hopefully lead to things like animal health monitoring. Uh, one other thing that I don't have in here is our most recent results. Uh, we have a farm in eastern Washington that's primarily dryland wheat and this farmer has been using our farm beat system for a little over a year now and uh, one of the things he does is uh, spraying so he sprays um, pesticides on his crop and with farm beets he was able to enable precision spraying and he actually decreased his spraying by 80 percent um, which is huge. So not only did this save him tens of thousands of dollars, but it's also better for the insects, it's better for the soil. He was also able to actually um, change the way that he's planting his seeds. So what he noticed is that in a lot of the sort of hilly areas of his farm, he would get less um, crop um, or yield. And what he actually did this year was he planted less seed in those area and he actually increased his year yield by more than double. Uh, so it's really exciting results. Uh, so to summarize, you know, FarmBeats is this end-to-end -end AI and IoT system for constrained environments. Um, and we solve different challenges like limited inter internet connectivity, power variability and you know it can expand beyond agriculture and the idea is that this is really a platform that we're providing that we can then 
um, have like third parties build on top of and provide more applications um, to enable different precision agriculture uh, techniques. Uh, thank you, that's it. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. In the interests of time, I'm going to suggest that we take questions to the chat, but please feel free to post your questions there. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Yeah, of course, thank you.